Hey guys, I know it's been forever and a day, but this is the long awaited video in my series of how I started my school. So this is the third video. And guys, you just really have to forgive me. You know, since all of this pandemic thing has happened, I've just been unmotivated and I just couldn't shake it. But I am so super excited for whatever reason to get back on that proverbial horse and to get these videos knocked out. So um, I just want to say once again how much I appreciate each of, each and every last one of you who have followed that series and who continues to check back for the next video. So without any further ado, here we go. Before I share my screen with you, I want to remind you guys about the first two videos in the series. The first video in the series of hi. All right, before I share my computer screen with you guys, I wanted to just tell you once again or remind you about the first two videos in this series. The first um, video in the series of how I started my school basically is a story time about how I got started. Um, quick, fast, and in a hurry, it gives an overview. I do think it's important for you to go and listen to it, particularly if you're someone who does do not have a lot of resources. I think it will give you a lot of motivation and inspiration along your journey uh, because a lot of times, like you know, I said in probably both of those videos, like I cannot believe the journey that I am on and how um, I don't want to say effortless, but how with a lot of ease or like I thought that I would, would have so many other problems or run into problems but I didn't and sometimes I did but you know I was able to get over them so make sure you check that out and then video two is when I really went over the differences between a charter school a private school and um, religious schools so I do think it's important for you to check those out and I will make sure I to put to link them above as well as to put them down below in the description box. All right, so I'm gonna start right here. I wanna share a document with you. It's called the US Department of Education, State Regulations of Private Schools. Now I did talk a little bit about this in our last video, but I wanted to show it to you in black and white because I know that the minimal requirements can be unbelievable, but um, I wanted to show it to you. And uh, this document, it was completed in 2009. Um, it was the most up-to-date one that I came across, but I think it is pretty much the rules and regulations. Um, now it has all of the states. I am in Georgia, and so that's on page 57. So we're gonna go to page 57. It's a lot. <laughs> really close. A couple more. All righty, here we go. And I am just gonna go through this a little bit with you. Um, as you can see right here where it says accreditation, registration, licensing, and approval. What does it say? No requirements for accreditation. So that's one thing um, you're gonna have to make a decision about. Now, I told you it is really important that you do become accredited because then it impacts what type of assistance you get from the state. But to start a school, um, you can be a private school, non-accredited, you're, you will not be forced to get accreditation um, if you don't want to. And so, as you can see in black and white yourself, you do not have to have accreditation. Um, there's no requirement for registration, no requirement for licensing, no requirement for approval. And so um, I know it's kind of unbelievable, <laughs> but you can open up shop and as long as you have your business license and um, whatever zoning issues are required, you have yourself a school. Let's look at the teacher certification. So as you can see right here, 
teacher certification is not required. Now, they do have a clause here that says, however, and but this is pertaining to a program with the state that will help to finance certain students' education. And we'll get into that probably in another video. But once again, I'm making that point that there are not a lot of really tough regulations that you will have to jump through different hoops with. Um, let's see length of school days. Now you do have to have 180 days and that's pretty much what is required in the public school system. However, you only have to do four and a half hours. That's four and a half hours. Now I do have a full day program, but I have also thought about not offering a full day program to kind of um, save money or cut down on costs, but um, I haven't done that, but it's an option. So I wanted you guys just to kind of really know um, curriculum. There is no particular curriculum that they are going to force you to use. Um, the only thing that they ask, and here we go right here, private schools must provide a basic academic educational program that includes reading, language arts, mathematics, social studies, and science. So as long as you're teaching those things, they're not going to tell you what curriculum that you have to buy. That is totally up to you. Now, when I was actually looking at this document again, I came across this and I really, I need to investigate more because I really don't know what it means, but it says the Georgia Department of Technical and Adult Education is authorized to contract with private schools to provide program or services deemed necessary. So that sounds like I could be getting some type of program or I guess offering some type of program that maybe is associated with that department. Um, I'm so glad that I went back and I really read through this because I, I didn't, matter of fact, I didn't have this when I first started my school. I told you I stumbled upon all of this, but that's real interesting to me. And so I think I am gonna definitely go back and find out what that is. So um, as we move on and we go to record keeping and reports, of course, you're pri as a private school, um, you must report your enrollment to the local school district. And yet, there's some guidelines on when to do that and how often and so forth. But that makes sense, right? Because um, at a certain age, you're required to go to school. And if you're not in the public schools, then the schools don't know that the child is being educated. So there is some type of communication, not difficult. Most of the public schools already have some type of form that you that they want you to use to report that information on. Let's see, um, health and safety. Let's see, private schools buildings must meet, meet all health and safety standards established under state law and, lo and local ordinances. So once again, you kind of have to um, go and see what that is for your particular state. But I think that's pretty much with, you know, with any business, right? That you want to make sure wherever you're holding your place of business, that it is one safe and then it is accessible for all. Let's see. Then it talks about a little bit about transportation, which is really no big deal. Um, textbooks. There is no state policy at this time. So once again, they're not gonna tell you what textbooks to use if you use textbooks at all. Um, testing, um, there is not a requirement for testing. However, once again, um, if you are gonna you know, receive, um, if your state have different funding for certain students, um, then they may, they may require some type of testing, but it's still not generally the state test. And you get to choose that. And I do give a test and it's more of a functional test to kind of really want to see where our students are functionally um, as, it, as, 
it pertains to how they will operate in the world um, because we are more a remedial school um, than anything else because I have the hope that my most of my students will transition back to public schools. And for those students who don't, it's because they're probably a little bit further um, behind academically and or um, that their deficits are um, a lot harder to remediate and that, you know, they may never reach certain levels. So um, in doing that, I always, my goal is to always get them to a point where they can function um, in the world. So I want a test that will let me know, like, how well is the student reading the newspaper? How well is this, is this student um, comprehending and, and is able to write, you know, basic paragraphs and all of that good stuff? All right, so I don't want to belabor that point. Um, we talked about testing, special education. And then this just goes on to say how some of the schools can uh, work with private schools to provide um, students with um, an education and so forth. Um, let's see, nursing and health, there's no state policy. Technology, there's no state policy. Professional development, there's no state policy. Um, reimbursement for performing state like local functions, no policy. Tax exemption, you would still be under the same um, educational tax exempt. So those things that you buy for your business um, that is um, educational, then you don't have to pay tax on it. And then the next one just talks about the public aid for private education, which says that Georgia's constitution prohibits public funds from flowing into religious organizations. However, there is another law. I don't want to say it supersedes that, but um, there's another program that don't discriminate against religious schools. You can be a religious school and provide certain services and still get um, some state funding. Um, let's see, then programs for financial assistance. And I will talk a little bit more about those things probably in another video. Um, and then it goes into like the regulations for homeschooling. And then that's all like really easy peasy, right? Nothing too difficult whatsoever. Now. I told you that I wanted to talk to you about private non-accredited, which we just went over. Now, if you just did the minimum on the um, in this document for your state, that means you have a private school that is not accredited. But we want you to take that extra step to get accredited, right? Right. Why? Because it will impact um, certain re financial resources and just really your reputation. Like you want your parents to be able to trust that the program that you develop is meeting requirements that their student is going to grow and so forth, right? Just got interrupted. Let's continue. Gotta love the kids, right? <laughs> okay. So I did a quick Google search, um, and I wanted it to be specific to the state of Georgia, but it's not quite what I got, but that's all good. Um, basically, I did a, a Google search on accrediting agencies in the state of Georgia. And as you can see, I got a whole list of things. And so when I tell you guys, there are tons and tons and tons of, well, I'm not gonna say tons and tons, but there are lots of accrediting agencies that you can go to become accredited. Now, in deciding this, you want to make sure that the programs that your state offers to help with certain students, that you want to make sure that you are going with one of their approved ones, right? So you can probably get a list of their approved ones and then go down that list. However, they are not all equal. Now, in that last video, I believe I talked about SACS and how it is this 
huge accrediting agencies and they their standards are like woo, ridiculous As a matter of fact i think they they do um colleges and so forth too they do the public districts and so forth and i'm, I'm not sure if it's nationally um but i know is more than just georgia so obviously i am not at a point where i am a red i'm ready for that type of um that type of uh accrediting agency and so once i did my research i felt like the georgia accrediting commission was really made for me and um it's a it's a it's still a pretty big agency here in georgia i think they focus only in georgia so that probably makes you know a difference too um, and then a lot of the private schools that are around here um, actually have their accreditation through them as well. So after you choose an accredited agency, then we want to go to that accredited agency's website. So here we are right here. I am on Georgia Accrediting Commission's website. And um, matter of fact, in doing this for you guys, I noticed <laughs> that we are supposed to develop this plan, this crisis plan for the current situation, and which I did not know. So now I know I'm going to have to go back and actually download that. All right. So uh, let's see. Let's go to member schools first. I want to show you guys where we are. Now, my school is specifically designed for kids with special needs or learning disabilities. And so I will fall under educational agencies with special purposes. But as you can see, they accredit private, private pre-kindergarten schools, private schools, non-traditional educational centers. Although I think there's been some change in that. They do public pre-K, public schools K through 12 and private um, pre-kindergarten. So I'm going to go to educational agencies with special purposes. This is where we are. And if you guys hear noise, my daughter, she came in here and she forgot to shut the door. But here we are right here. Triumph Transitions Institute. Director Cindy Lumpkin. Cool beans. That's always, ooh, ooh, that's always kind of cool to see. Let's see. All right, Georgia Accrediting Commission. I kind of, all right, let me go and close my door. All right, so here we go. I want to go to, let's see, GCA standards. All right, so, um, when you go to your site, um, consultation, consultant visitation program. So I had to get a consultant. And matter of fact, if you go here, they provide you, if you go here, they provide you with a list of their consultants. And so you would just go down the list, it lists their qualifications and what they're approved to give you, to um, do accreditation for. And so when I went down this list, I promise you, I went down reading and praying, <laughs> reading and praying that God would just lead me to the right person that would really work with me and get me over all the humps that I needed without gouging my pockets because they are quite expensive. It's like $250 an hour, if I'm not mistaken but that is a requirement so before you call or do anything else your first stop is to get a consultant and then they will come out and chit chat with you or whatever um before i did all of that though i kind of researched everything so um let's see for me i did some of this seems standards for non-traditional no. so here's the standards for educational agencies with special purposes and then there is standards uh, accreditation procedures for kindergarten 
I think there was two different lists that I had to go. Okay, here we go. So accreditation requirements for all schools. So this would pretend no matter what school you have or what school you want to have, whether it is kindergarten, um, pre-K, um, K through 12, these are the different things that you must have. And as you can see, they list um, how many hours per year that you have to do. Here you start with personnel and then it actually starts really telling you what the requirements are. And this is where you're going to see the difference in night and day of the different requirements. So a principal or headmaster or manager, whatever you, the title you give that person in leadership, they may serve in such capacity only one school agency or center at the same time. So you can't, I guess, be over multiple ones. See, whenever the person designated at the, as the principal headmaster or manager of the school leaves the position, you got to go and do, you got to let them know. This is when the school is uh, relocating and all of that good stuff. I don't want to go through all of this because um, it'll just make this drag on, but I wanted you guys to get the gist of it um, because all I did was I went down and read each one of these things and make sure that I was able to satisfy it or I had some type of alternative to what they, they said. Um, even this is, now I will say this, this is the part that scared me so much because they say that they, you need to show that you are fiscally sound. Well, I didn't know like, like how do you do that or what were they expecting? And um, I think they kind of go into details at some point, but all I did in the beginning um, was, did I do? I think I may have had an audit, but that I did have an audit and a budget. And in the audit, because I wasn't paying myself at the time, and then I had a coworker who, um, actually came out and volunteered. Well, because we were certified teachers, then all of the hours that we poured into the organization, we were able to put it in our, um, we were able to put it in as if we were charging for what a, a teacher would get paid and have that on our um, audit. <laughs> so girl, like, okay, yeah. So we were able to log all of, those hours that translated back to money on our tax um, exemption, on our audit, I meant. And so that made it look like I was working with way more money than what I really had. Um, I want to say, I think I by the time I had the audit done, I, I did get up to close to maybe like 15,000, maybe $20,000 in my um, account, but the audit showed close to maybe 30, 35,000. And that was because I was given credit for all of those hours that I was logging as a, a professional teacher, as well as my coworker. So that's kind of how, that was kind of how we kind of beefed that up a little bit. Um, and then here's the physical plant. So as you can see, there's just so many different things that you have to have, like specifically of uh, safety preparedness plans, fire drills monthly. Um, you're starting to see some of the same things that public schools require here. Um, fire extinguishers and all of that good stuff. And so it's like what, one through 28 just in the physical plant. And then if we go back then, so that's for everybody, right? And then you have to decide where, what are you getting accredited for? So is it gonna be K through 12 or is it gonna be like me, agency with special purposes? And so once you click here, it goes through telling you, um, the different certification levels. So accreditation, classification, you can get um, preparation status. Do not settle for that uh, because that's really, 
it's nothing. You'll be paying your money for nothing if you're just doing that. So you can go from preparation status to provisional all in one meeting. Um, if you really have your stuff together, you can go from preparation to accredited status in one meeting. However, I went from here to here in one meeting and then it took me another year to do what I needed to do in order to do the um, accredited status. So, and then, so right here, what does the prep preparation status require? Um, all of this, four things. Then if you're gonna do the provisional, um, what is it, eight more things. And then if you do the accredited status, it's eight things and so forth. And then here are, here are all the principles that you are graded on. Two, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm gonna close out of this and then I'm gonna turn around Okay guys, so as you can see, completely doable, right? I know it's like once you get to the accreditation part, it feels a little bit more overwhelming, but I promise you, you can get through it. Take it one number, one principle, one standard at a time, um, and you're gonna be okay. So if you have any specific questions, make sure you write them below. In addition, um, the upcoming videos are going to be on um, the curriculum that I chose to use as well as um, financials um, or how did I raise money? Where did that initial, those initial funds come from? I am going to go into more detail and I'll probably do two separate videos on that. And the money one is probably going to come first because I know that is at the end of the day um, is what you're going to need because so at some point you're going to have to prove that you can be fiscally sound. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little long, but hopefully you got tons of information out of it. All right. Bye bye.